Snow Tracks is sponsored by ski -Doo. What matters is what's next. Yamaha Conquer Snow. And by FXR Racing Full Throttle Addiction. With snow biking becoming such a hot topic in the sled industry, we thought what a better way to understand just where these new machines fit than comparing them to another very viable off-trail sled, the new 800 Switchback Assault with a 2.0 paddle. Yes, these two are very different, but the question that I get asked the most when somebody sees a snow bike for the first time is, without a doubt, are these gonna take over snowmobiling? Seems strange as a sled has been a track and two skis for, well, forever. And while I don't think it's as simple as a yes or no answer, I do wanna tell you what conclusion I've come to after my experience over the past two years with snow bikes. While they aren't polar opposites, they are quite a bit different. Sure, both of them have a track and you ride them on snow, but that's pretty much where the similarities end. Snow bikes are at their infancy, but they're gaining momentum and bringing new riders into the sport. While the cost of a brand new 450 electric start bike and a timber sled kit is actually more than a new assault, there are a ton of motocross and enduro riders twiddling their thumbs all winter long, who with nothing more than just the timber sled kit could be out enjoying the snow. With this kind of untapped potential now being accessible, we could be looking at a huge way to grow our sport. While a snow bike may not look like a normal snowmobile, it's a progression of our sport, allowing us to access folks who already are motorheads. I know that I sound over the top about snow bikes, but the truth is it's to help me shape my opinion about whether one of these new snow vehicles can actually take on a snowmobile head to head. Snow bikes are not trail legal at this point, but I wouldn't want to rack on 100 plus miles in a day on one anyways. That's just not what I see as being the calling. Likewise, the tight trees, vertical power lines, and narrow single track are places I just can't get without the potential for serious damage to an assault. And this is where the snow bikes shine. Truly an off trail, off the map, off in a place that you never thought possible to get to is where these rigs are in their glory and where you will easily take yourself should you find one in your garage. The beauty of a snow bike is its ability to traverse steep, deep, and technically challenging terrain with relative ease. I mean, it's not simple, but it does make it a lot easier to do, and you can go places and do things that you would never think possible as a beginner on a snowmobile. Side hilling is one of the areas I find the snow bike to shine. While the Axis chassis is nothing short of incredible at side hilling and deep snow, the truth is a snow bike doesn't require hardly any effort at all. You just ride it out. If you get tired, put your hillside knee out and rest. Because of the narrowness, they allow you huge leverage to traverse otherwise technical sled terrain. Now on the flip side, when the powder gets crazy deep and the pillows and hits are huge, I'll be honest, while I do like the snow bike, it's fun and all, there is nothing like hitting a big powder pillow with a long track sled and launching a huge air. With great experience on a snow bike, you may be able to do this, but even with my relatively decent seat time, I can huck a sled so much easier. Pull wheelies, carve powder turns, and just about all round play with greater ease. Not to mention that with my Assault, I can head back to the trail and put on a few hundred miles should I choose to go for a good ride. So herein lies the dilemma. How could a snow bike ever take on a sled? It allows you to get to places that are far more remote with greater ease, but you just can't go on the trail anything like you can with a snowmobile. I believe for me a snow bike will be a permanent fixture here at Snow Tracks. I've found its ability to ride out very technical terrain, where with a sled the outcome of a slight misjudgment may be a hefty parts bill, to be incredibly easy, hugely satisfying, and ultimately a blast. I don't foresee putting on huge miles with a snow bike, but I do see the amazing potential of exploring new and untracked terrain that I've always wanted to get to because of its relative ease of use. Now on the flip side, I will never be without a track and two skis. The way a sled feels and the ability to both trail ride, but for me more importantly play off trail is something I struggle to put words to. While I may not go as many places as I can with a snow bike, it's not any less enjoyable, it's just different. The sled I find easier to get off the ground and the bike I find easier to ride in very technical places, but both are incredibly fun to ride and a blast in the powder. So I guess the simple answer for me is no, I don't think that snow bikes are gonna take over for snowmobiles, but I do think you're gonna find an increasing number of them parked next to off-trail riders' sleds in the very near future. Snow Tracks is sponsored by MBRP Performance Exhaust. Race-inspired, trail-proven. 
John Blacher is product planning manager for Yamaha's North American snowmobile division. Recently, we sat John down in an effort to ask him questions aimed at getting at the root of Yamaha's motivation for building the all new triple cylinder Genesis turbocharged snowmobile power plant. But what really piqued our interest in turbocharged engines was the mountain market. You know we're a dedicated four-stroke company for the most part, other than the utility division. And uh, the mountain market's been dominated by two-strokes, about 90, 95%. But the challenge with the mountain two-stroke sometimes becomes durability. So we wanted to find an answer to that at high elevation of four-stroke that was obviously durable, but could also make the power. The benefits of high elevation for turbocharging really outweighed the benefits of supercharging, which would have been more a, a sea level snowmobile. Obviously, there were specific development targets for this all new turbocharged engine. Let's drill down and find out what some of those goals were. So we really had three primary development targets for this engine. Obviously, power and torque, that's the one we would increase the power of the vehicle. And the second one and the most challenging one was throttle response. Turbocharged systems, it's very, very difficult to get accurate and quick throttle response. You've got a system in the middle. And the third really was um, high elevation automatic compensation for elevation changes. John was not shy in expressing the cooperation that existed between Arctic Cat and Yamaha in the development of the new turbo. Obviously, Arctic Cat had a big stake in the engine. It powers all the new 9000 series Arctic Cat models. You know, of course, there was tremendous collaboration between Yamaha and Articat to get this vehicle done. You can imagine the components that the vehicle shares, the intake system, the exhaust system, even the cooling, all the, all the panels on the side had to be designed to allow this vehicle to get the heat out of it. So, you know, the fuel tank was changed. So Articat had a big hand in designing some components of the system for sure. And without that collaboration, we couldn't have done it. And you know, even though there's a lot of common elements that you kind of have to get together on, we still try and keep some unique differences that we refer to as Yamaha DNA. So we kept our own clutches, pretty important to us. We've got incredible belt durability and lots of history with our clutches. Our clutches are um, strong and durable to high, high rates of horsepower beyond anything we build from the engine. And of course the design, the look and appeal, and that's really important to us, the color and graphics and some of the unique panels that give it that Yamaha feeling. We didn't want one to drive by at 50 miles an hour and no one was quite sure what it was. We wanted to drive by at 50 and say, oh, that's a Yamaha. There are significant differences between the all new turbo Yamaha power plant and previous turbocharged snowmobile engines. There's a lot of detail to drill down on. This engine has some differences to other traditional snowmobile turbocharged engines. I mean, first of all, it's a high revving three cylinder engine. Turbos give the engine a lot of torque, but they do offer a challenge on getting throttle response. And most of that just managing air pressure. Um, everyone asks us, how much boost does it make? Well, that number's almost irrelevant, but the number you're looking for is an absolute number. Or let's say 20, you're shooting for 20. We're breathing about 14 PSI right now, atmospheric pressure. You add six to it, you get a certain horsepower number. As you go up in elevation, that number changes. So you can maintain that 20 PSI absolute number as long as you've got some extra boost. So what we did differently a little bit to manage throttle response, we have three individual throttle bodies. No one else that we know of is doing that. Not even Ferrari's doing that. We also use a bypass system instead of a blow-off valve to atmosphere. So a lot of car companies are doing that as well. That allows us to control the airbox pressure while you're off throttle and keep the little turbine spinning. One of the big challenges with turbines is that as you get off the throttle, it'll stall the compressor and RPM of the compressor comes down. And because that compressor has some mass, you get back on the throttle. Before you get boost coming back, the compressor has to re-spin up again. So we used a very small turbocharger, but we made it really, really efficient. It's a little bit strange, but this fall on the snowmobile consumer show circuit, Yamaha was actually promoting horsepower numbers that were greater than what were originally released for the new turbo engine. 180 horsepower is what we were told the motor produces, and yet we have seen claims, and Yamaha standing behind them, of up to 200 horsepower. We asked John, what's the real story here? Horsepower numbers, interesting numbers to talk about. Um, you know, if you look in all of our official materials, as soon as you see the number 180. And basically that's the least amount of horsepower this engine's ever gonna make. So whether you're at 4,000 feet or 10,000 feet, that's kind of the number you're really gonna see in the real world all the time and nothing less than that number. Dyno numbers you see in the world, you'll see it's always a corrected peak horsepower number. Engines, when they're dyno, tend to kind of snap the rev limiter for a second and they create a very big number for a short period of time. And then the engine typically drops down a little bit and carries a sustained number. 
So while we say 180 in the brochure, that's kind of the promise to the customer. That's engineering's promise. This engine will never deliver less than 180 horsepower. And anyone who's ridden one says right away, there's no way this is 180 horsepower. I mean, it just puts the boots to anything else that we would have quoted as 180 in the past. So yeah, Dynotech gets a hold of it and they dyno one at 204 and they dyno another one at 211. And those are corrected to sea level numbers in optimum conditions. So we tend not to talk about that horsepower. There might be a banner in a brochure or at a trade show or something, but you won't find it in our official materials. And it's just Yamaha's way in the past. We've always tended to under-promise and over-deliver, but you'll always get 180, and that 180 is a real 180. The arrival of this all-new turbocharged power plant and transmission represents a ginormous investment in tooling and engineering to bring it to the market. This speaks volumes about Yamaha's commitment to the snowmobile business. We wanted John to carve that out for us in detail. This engine represents a huge investment into the snowmobile industry, and we're a little bit fortunate that we have other divisions that can take advantage of parts of it. But yeah, no matter what, this is the only turbocharged version, and that's for the snowmobile business. And so that does represent a huge investment. Manpower, tooling, uh, manufacturing, vendor procurement. And so it's, uh, you know, we're invested because we're very proud to be the only four season Japanese company. We're the only ones that build summer and winter toys. So I think you're gonna see us continue to invest as we move forward. Snow Tracks is sponsored by snowmobileinquebec.com. Experience a ride you'll never forget. Does anybody else remember the good old days when the only real decision you had to make when buying a snowmobile suit was leather or not leather? Now I say the good old days in jest because the truth is there really was very little good with those old suits. Today, we have almost as much technology in what we wear as there is in what we ride. High-tech fabrics, heat management, methods of construction, layering systems, gear today is so much more than just what you see on the outside. FXR is at the forefront of technical outdoor clothing design, and they've come up with a long list of high-tech stuff that's incorporated into the suits they make. All of it is designed specifically to keep you warm, dry, and safe. One bit of technology FXR has been using in many of their suits for a few years now is called FAST, and it's often overlooked. Most people don't even realize the suit they're wearing has this important safety feature already working for them. FAST stands for Flotation Assist Safety Technology. Simply put, it's a type of insulation that's excellent at keeping you warm, but also won't waterlog and cause you to sink like a stone if you do end up in the drink. Typical snowmobile suit insulation acts like a sponge when it gets wet. Once wet, it becomes extremely heavy, restricts movement, and makes even the prospect of getting out of the water a daunting one. Fast insulation is pretty much the opposite. It's designed to be buoyant, which means it brings you back to the surface of the water quickly and will keep you afloat for up to two hours, which is obviously a lot more time than you're actually gonna need. Furthermore, it doesn't soak up water like traditional insulation, so it doesn't become more bulky when it's wet and therefore doesn't restrict your ability to move. If you do ever find yourself floating in freezing water, you know you'll be able to easily swim to the shore or edge of the ice and climb out without your suit getting in the way. Now, when FAST was first described to me by Milt at FXR, I immediately got visions of those old floater suits from the 90s that were basically just a glorified life jacket with more material on the outside. To say they were awful is an understatement. So awful, in fact, most people preferred to take the risk and not even wear one, myself included. So when Milt told me that some of FXR's most popular suits already have FAST technology, I was blown away. The Adrenaline XPE and Team FX jackets for trail riders the excursion and hardware jackets for the outdoors crowd. And since the monosuit thing is taking off like a rocket, the Svalbard and Squadron both have fast inside. And finally, the Svalbard parka like I have on right now for everyday use. Now on the women's side, fast equipped suits include the Adrenaline, the Team and the Svalbard jacket, as well as the Squadron and Svalbard monosuits. And last but not least, the entire FXR youth and child lineup includes fast insulation in every suit. So if your kid is wearing an FXR jacket this winter, they'll float. I'd strongly suggest avoiding it, but if they do end up in the lake or a really deep puddle, you know they aren't gonna sink. Back in the day, I can understand why a person would have chosen not to wear a floater suit. They were uncomfortable, cold, and they looked ridiculous. But still, 
People who know the outdoors and know how to survive in adverse conditions will always tell you, hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Today with FXR's amazing advancements in materials and clothing design and their innovative fast insulation, following that mantra has become pretty much effortless and way more stylish. Snow Tracks is sponsored by Princess Auto, a unique world of equipment, tools, and more. Closed captioning of Snow Tracks is sponsored by Triton Trailers, built for adventure. It would appear that Arctic Cat owns more iconic handles than the other OEMs. To prove that point, this year we've already done an in-depth review of the rebirth of the iconic Thundercat. On this week's test ride, we're going to go in-depth on another iconic Arctic Cat, the El Tigra. El Tigra goes way back in Arctic Cat's history to a time when the company used Kawasaki engines. Some students of history claim the emergence of Arctic Cat Green is actually rooted in Kawasaki's indigenous ownership of the color. However, the El Tigra handle in our books made snowmo history when Arctic Cat literally resurrected itself from bankruptcy in 1984 and rose to become the solid industry player it is today. The very first sleds the reborn Arctic Cat produced were El Tigras, and they were special. Model year 17 El Tigras are cast in a similar mold. They're premium featured trail sleds based on the Pro Cross chassis. What sets them apart from the crowd is the relatively small number that were built and the need for you to have early ordered your copy. El Tigras come with premium Fox QS3 shocks on the front IFS and on the rear arm. A non-adjustable coilover Fox IFP shock supports the front arm. These shocks are not just a good idea. For model year 2017, we've been crowing their benefits on virtually every model Arctic Cat has bolted them on. The idea of rationalizing shock damping into three easy to select settings makes the somewhat daunting task of trying to sort out as much as 20 separate levels of damping unbelievably easier. The levels of damping performance go from soft to medium to firm in a millisecond. The good news is this, you can discern the difference each of the three settings makes in the El Tigra's ride quality. El Tigras are available with 600 dual stage injection power, 1049 four stroke power, and 800 EFI power. You can get 129 and 137 inch 600s and 800s, while 1049s are only available with 129 inch tracks. The El Tigras engine profile is impressive and offers diverse performance from the potent DSi 600 and the 800 EFI. If you're a four stroke guru, then the 1049 will satisfy and deliver respectable fuel economy. For our money, we like the 600 and 800 two strokes because that's what an El Tigra should be. Arctic Cat continues to produce the Procross with two annoying issues. The first is the dual skag anti-darting carbides and the second is an unbelievably awkward oil tank filler. The dual skag carbides generate unrepentant understeer under all but cement quality hard pack. Arctic Cat believes the anti-darting benefits of these skags justifies the understeer they generate. Frankly, we don't buy it. We replace these dual skags with a set of woody six inch carbides. The oil filler issue is harder to understand. Having to undo multiple Zeus fasteners while prying the bodywork back and attempting to pour an oil bottle in the tight confines available makes no sense. We await an update. Thankfully, the El Tigras, whether 129 or 137, benefit from Arctic's slide action floating front arm skid. This design has been improved and perfected to deliver an outstanding ride in jigglers and a compliant and bottomless feel through square edgers. The addition of Fox QS3s was the missing piece of the puzzle for this suspension. With the rear arm QS3s set on full soft and the spring preload set at a couple inches of sag, the new El Tigra can hold its own against the Polaris Pro XC and Skidoo's benchmark R motion. In terms of performance, there's little debate around the posh, well-lit Supertrax Snow Tracks offices. The 600 DSi Twin is our favorite 600 class motor. The 800 is a little long in the tooth, but it is drop-dead reliable. And the 1049 four-stroke triple 
Well, it is unabashedly our favorite four-stroke, period. The final piece of the 2017 Arctic Cat El Tigre is the outstanding retro and memory-inspiring graphic presentation of the sled. It looks every bit the part, the El Tigre, in all its glory. Arctic Cat has paid attention to the exclusivity of the El Tigre by making this model relatively scarce and thus somewhat exclusive. From a performance perspective, buyers can have it their way with a myriad of track and engine choices. This question remains to be answered. Does the re-emergence of the El Tigre in model year 17 enhance or erode the iconic reputation of this much loved handle? That question will be answered by no one. It is a judgment left in the hands of time. Snow Tracks has been sponsored by Polaris. See endless possibilities. Arctic Cat, share our passion. And by Northwest Ontario. What are you doing this weekend? If you enjoyed the video that you just watched, like it and then subscribe to our page for more great content from Snowtracks TV.